All right, Brad, really excited to dive into this past week's episode and bring in some of our takeaways as well as feedback from the community. And, and what I wanted to start with is what I am coining the thousand dollar challenge. Now, I know I can see the curiosity. You want to know more, right? I cannot wait. <laughs> I'm on bated breath. There it is. Uh, so I'm not even going to ask how you're doing. That's how excited <laughs> I am. So let's just hop right in. Well. Yeah, yeah. I hear you're sneaking in there. Uh, you know, I feel like every single personal finance kind of guidelines start with, Hey, you need to have a thousand dollars, right? Start with a thousand dollars. If you're paycheck to paycheck, let's get that first thousand dollars locked down. And for the record, I do not disagree. Uh, but I think it kind of poses a question how, and I think many people come into this saying, well, I'm paycheck to paycheck. Cause I'm paycheck to paycheck. What, what can I do? And I think with a little creativity, you can solve this and develop this for your own, you know, maybe places that you can optimize. But in case you've never gone through the thought exercise, I thought we could do it today. All right. Sounds intriguing. All right. So for, I guess I should say something that I've been doing personally is I've really been taking advantage of the, uh, the secondhand market. And I've been doing this from the position of a seller. Uh, I went through my garage. My garage felt cluttered. And while I could have just taken it all and either you know thrown it away or taken it through a thrift store, I said, I wonder if there's any value here. And first of all, I want to say there's really nothing more humbling and simultaneously empowering than realizing that um, stuff that you purchased, you you can't you can't sell for 50% of what you bought it or 30% of what you bought it, which kind of goes to like, we put all this pressure on buying all the new stuff, but it's not worth anything. Yeah, this is something I've long, long seen at garage sales. I know my father-in-law, Laura's dad, is famous for his garage sales where he sells everything for a quarter. <laughs> it's not even worth putting out the table. <laughs> right. It's, it's absolutely not. But he loves his, uh, his entire jug of quarters. So, right. um, but I mean, jokes aside, the things you buy, they weigh you down. And really, we're buying them in many cases, a lot of people, to keep up with the Joneses, right? To have that nice house, to have the nice throw pillows and nice lamps and all these things. And honestly, they're probably worth about a quarter. Thereafter, I mean, maybe you get some satisfaction from them, but if you think I've seen people talk about these things, Jonathan, as an investment, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I love how we, t we talk about these. Oh, my precious. It's an investment. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It's so silly. I mean, and you hear that word thrown around with lots of different consumer items, right? A car as an investment. I mean, we know it as the greatest depreciable asset you can possibly buy. So I kind of chuckle it to myself when I hear investment, but I mean, you do hear this with people going out to buy things and saying like, oh, I have all these things that are worth something. Well, they're only worth something until you go to sell it. Yeah. Now that's actually interesting. And it kind of says there's two halves to this equation. One is kind of that stop. Like if you're going to have an investment, have an investment, don't delude yourself. You're, you're talking about speculation and you're calling it an investment and like 99.9% .9 of the time it's going to work against you. You know, when they talk about a car that sold at auction 60 years later for $600,000, like you could do a time money, time value of money calculation and have three or four times that. When you talk about your baseball, baseball card collection, Brad, I think you're actually guilty. Oh, yeah. Your comic book collection. Like <laughs> I'm dying inside right now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. How many baseball, how much money did you spend on baseball cards as a kid? Yeah. I mean, I spent all my money quite, I mean, quite literally everything. I don't think I've ever told you this. My first job as a kid was working in a comic book and baseball card store. Now they had some significant investments. Oh yes, they did. They did. And uh, I mean, I, yeah, I was 13 or 14 years old. I actually worked up to being the manager of this store, like at 14 years old would open the, open the place, which is absurd. Obviously it's utterly laughable, but I would open the store up. I would turn the alarm off. I would, you know, do everything with the cash register and such. And it was, I mean, it was a great experience, but yeah, I mean, I probably spent, I don't know, many, many, many thousands of dollars on baseball cards and comic books. And I mean, this is probably an entire episode in and of itself. We should explore this, right? I oh. could get a couch out for you. And yeah. Uh, no, but there's a lot to it. There really is. There's <laughs> supply and demand. There's scarcity, right? Like all the kids my age, their dads told them the story of their grandma. That sold that one baseball right. that was signed by the entire team. Right. Or the Mickey Mantle rookie card that they threw out. But what we didn't realize was they're only worth something because tens of millions of grandmas threw them out. And there's only mm. a couple thousand of them left. Whereas every kid my age saved the 1985 top set in pristine condition and there are 50 million of them, right? 
I was at the uh, the grocery store just the other day and I happened to see a wall of like, I think it was Yu-Gi-Oh cards, maybe like some sort of like collectible playing card for kids, Mark, maybe Pokemon cards. I don't know. Uh, and I was thinking, oh, collectibles that you might want to hold on to that one. There's probably a winner in there, but only if you don't open the package or you immediately encase it in a block of glass and don't touch it for 30 years. So the corners aren't touched, right? I mean, this is the thing. It's only worth something if you don't use it. So you have something that's occupying physical space. It's only going to be worth something if you never open it, if you never use it. Look at that point, if you really are, you're not even talking about enjoying the item. You're just talking about like it being worth something down the road, invest in something that's actually going to be worth something down the road. And if your thing is worth something now, just offload it while someone else is still crazy enough to buy it. That kind of brings us to the yeah. second half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my uh, five minute sidebar here. So tell me about the thousand dollar challenge and what this looks like. Okay. So I think if, if all of us are kind of having this wake up, like, wow, I really need to get started on my financial plan. The, 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 the stacks and stacks of baseball cards that I'm still holding on to for kid are probably worth in summation, although it's about 70 pounds, they're probably worth about $70 total, right? Or someone's actually charging us to go through them and sell them. Like, let's just figure out what we can do to actually start from scratch. So I have like three or four ideas. One is, although at a garage sale, you are going to make literally pennies on the dollar, far less, a quarter on average, and someone's going to try and negotiate your quarter down to 10 cents. Happens every single time. You just glare at them to get out of here. <laughs> I can't even look at you. All right. So if that's the case, then let's not do garage sales when we're trying to get our thousand dollars. I mean, you can, if it's all knickknacks and you want to accrue something, but let's take a look at all the stuff that we have that in our minds is now becoming associated with clutter. And let's look at the higher value items. Maybe you have a leaf blower, but you're living in an apartment complex. You don't even have room to store it. You, you have uh, accumulated stuff that you purchase that you've literally have never had time to use. You're full of buyer's remorse but it's still in relatively good shape. You know, there's some sort of demand for it. I have, uh, there's two big options, Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist. I honestly feel, and I'm kind of surprised, but you can put them on both and you should put them on both. Um, Facebook Marketplace is, it's hopping right now. I mean, it's, it's really working well. So I uh, had a uh, stationary bike that uh, my wife had wanted several years ago. She's never used it, never. So I paid $250 for it. It was a had less than 20 hours of ride time. You could still find the Amazon listing. Go get the stock pictures on Amazon and bring them over onto Facebook Marketplace. Bring the copy over and say, why pay full price when you can get it for 50% off? You know, that was my first $150. And then I took that and I did this on Facebook Marketplace that the new year, people are getting exercise equipment. I got $150 there. If you're too lazy to do this or you feel like you don't have enough time, like give it to your kids as a side hustle. Hey, you do all the work and you get to keep 50% of this right? Have some, get them used to selling it. Be careful. They might say, Hey mom, can I sell that? No, no, you can't. <laughs> so, okay. Hold on. Just to be clear. So this was an exercise bike you bought for 250 brand new a couple years ago. Yeah. And you put it up for sale on both Craigslist and put Facebook it, marketplace. Put it up for sale on both Craigslist and Facebook marketplace. It was just a head to head yeah. test. What was the listing price you put it at? I just went straight to 150. Now I'm, I, I, I figured based on looking at a few of what the bicycles were selling for, that that was a very competitive, non-negotiable price. I could leave it there as long as, you know, if I, and it's a new year, people still have new year's resolutions on January 1st, January 2nd, right? They've all broken them now, but that first week, come on. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So best practice. Are there any actionable tips? Like you know, I've used Craigslist in the past, but it's been years. So I don't know if there's yeah. anything different. Like talk us through, are there any fees to list? Are there any fees at mm. all? Are there anything you should be looking out for? Like talk us through how this actually works. This is this, you need to have pictures. You got a smartphone, take a couple pictures, take five or six pictures from different sides and just think through what your copy should be. And, and what I mean by copy is like the, what is the headline for this? So in my case, it was like absolutely brand new, you know, highly reviewed exercise bike for fractions of what you would pay new, something like that, right? Uh, or you could actually put the description of what the item is in the copy, go over onto wherever you would buy this when it was new, if you can still find the listing. Many cases you can't, even if it's been discontinued, you can find a listing somewhere, even if it's on eBay. Copy the entire listing over and then down at the bottom say, and this is, if it's true, you know, I bought this two years ago. It has less than 20 hours of use. So it's virtually brand new. You can now purchase it for less than 50% of that cost. Make the smart decision. Get this one today. Make this the ride. Make this the ride of 2020, right? All right. So if you just put a little bit of thought into how you want to market and sell these things, you can walk through your garage and, and on the one end, you could look at all the missed opportunity, time value money, how much this money would have been worth if you had invested. Or you could just say, you know what? Mistakes made, moving forward, decluttering, going to start building this fund. 
And I have made now using that tactic and technique and decluttering my garage, I'm up to $550. Like, I mean, halfway to this thousand dollar challenge, right? I have some other ideas on how you can round this out. All right. So uh, obviously I want to hear them, but first, uh, are there any items you've noticed in particular? I imagine you've done some research on both Facebook marketplace and Craigslist things that tend to hold value. Are there specific items in the house that people should be looking for? You know, not everything is worth something, right? Like I'm assuming, and this is based on nothing other than my own, my own brain, like clothes probably are not going to get 50% of the original purchase price, right? Whereas you're saying you got 60% of the original purchase price for this brand, essentially brand new bike. So talk me through like categories you've seen that have worked in particular and things that people should just say, eh, it's probably not worth my time for the listen. Yeah. Uh, so I guess actually this is the perfect point. Although we just threw garage sales under the bus here, uh, a quarter is not worth a whole lot, but you know, if you can, if you have a ton of quarters, you're talking about 200 to 300. So what I would do is I would aggregate everything, make that big messy pile in the garage and separate between the, you know, the 80, 20, the high value items. Maybe you have four or five high value items. See if you can sell those individually. And then if you're looking at things that, you know, you're, the list price is going to be three, $4 here and there, it's probably not even worth the time that it's going to take you to actually create the listing. And you can make a case that it is, but you know, at some point there is a, there's a point of diminishing return. So that's the point at which now we're thinking garage sale, right? Um, anything that I can set or bundle, anything that I think is going to bring me like $25 or beyond. And I have some sense of that because I know what I paid for it new. And I believe the depreciation on this will be minimal. I'm going to try and do those as individual items. And then if it's down in that kind of five, six, $10 range or below, I'm going to, at that point, I'm aggregating all together and say, all right, this is our decluttering yard sale. And then there's specific practices and maybe we could uh, find or generate some content around how, how to have a successful yard. So at that point though, in my mind, all of this is a wash, right? This is the penalty for having crap, a lot of crap. And if you get a quarter at a time, let's add it all up. And maybe this is something you can even have your kids help with that sort of thing and make it a big family event. But it's kind of that tax for drift for years and years. Nice. Yeah, I like that. All right. So you're 550 in. It sounds like you've sold a couple of big items. What next? How do you yeah. get to the thousand? So first is what can you sell to create more income? The second half of this, and this is kind of just like the equation of life is, so how can you earn more? How can you spend less, right? How can you apply a little bit of intentionality to spending less? And when you look at the black hole in most people's budget, it is, it's food, right? I mean, this is such an easy way over a short period of time. It's food. So this is where I like the idea of doing a no spin challenge. You started the new year, you've got Christmas and the holidays have just kind of passed. And maybe you're just kind of regretting how much all of that cost. And you just need to slow down for a little bit. So instead of committing yourself to a no spend year, which is not a bad idea, but it's a little extreme. I mean, people do it and their lives are changed by it, but I'm not saying that that's the, you know, what if we did 30 days? What would it look like over 30 days to not spend anything that wasn't essential? Could we take this on as a family challenge? Could we gamify this? And anytime we were bored, come up with a solution for the boredom that does not involve spending money. 30 days. Anytime you have an impulse to go do something, to go spend money, evaluate how much that would have cost. Say, nope, not doing that. And then go do something that's a, a free alternative. Take the money that you would have spent of that, add it to your thousand dollar fund, call that a win. Do the same thing with your meals. You want to go out, you want to go get uh, a big, you know, a meal at Chipotle. It's only, oh, it's only seven bucks a burrito. You got three of you. It's going to be 28 bucks. You know what? We're going to make tacos at home. We're going to add it into the grocery budget at home. All right. How much did you just save on that? You just went from seven or $8 a person, you know, times four down to $10 total. That's that's, and that adds up. You don't, I think a lot of us, so it's part of a no spend month. It's the stuff, you know, it's the food, it's the clothing. It's just, let's just reel it in. Let's do a combination of earning more by decluttering and let's go through all the things that we do passively without analyzing them. And to be honest, we, we don't even appreciate it anymore. We just expect it, right? Just, oh, it's that time. <laughs> It's that time. We're let's go. Let's go to Panda Express, right? No, well, no. Let's just for thirty days. Can we for thirty days just be intentional about this? That's my thousand dollar challenge. I bet you, if you were to take this on, let's say now it's the this is going to go live almost towards the end of January. What if for February, as a group, we said we're going to lock down this thousand dollars? Yeah, I like that. You know, it's it's interesting. The word intention, right? You use that a couple of times in there. I think there's there are so many different ways to do this. I, I'm actually thinking just as a brainstorm, totally off the top of my head, of a, a hybrid method, which is, okay, obviously people do have to spend some money. 
either on needs, clearly, or some people just buy things that are wants. And you can do that in the mindless grazing way. I mean, I am susceptible to this all the time. You go to Amazon, you click twice, and it's, it's bought, right? You might apply a little intention, right? So there's a couple different ways. First, camel, 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 which we talk about all the time. Every single product that exists on Amazon, which is essentially every single product that exists in the world, you can put a price watch on camel, camel, camel. You can look at the historical price and you can see, all right, this item varies between $20 and $50. And I kid you not, you're going to see that much variation on almost every product that exists. Breaks your mind. Up. Right? It's insane. So you put a price watch on and say, all right, I'm going to put a pause on this. I don't need this right now. Maybe I was prepared to pay $45 for it, but I'm going to put a price watch on. And when it gets down to $25, I'll buy it. All right? And then maybe at that point you might decide, ah, eh, I didn't really need it. So maybe you'll have saved the full 45 or maybe you'll just have saved the $20 delta between the 45 you were willing to pay at that moment of weakness, essentially, versus the 25 that you put the price watch on. That's something to consider. So is that $20 saved? I mean, I think you can make an argument that that's $20 saved. So there's ways to look at this of in the near term. If you're thinking about buying something, we just said, we set up this entire thing with everything is available for resale on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. Take the thing that you were going to buy and do a quick search. Again, apply some intention, right? It takes you 30 extra seconds to do a quick search in those two spots in your local area and see if it's available. Maybe you'll have saved money on something that you were going to click buy or go out to the store to purchase, right? Jonathan, I mean, that's not saving in the traditional sense that I think a lot of personal finance experts would say. But I got to tell you, I think that's money saved. I think you take the money that you save and you move it over. So there is a physical thousand dollars at the end of this. So, I mean, we got a new month coming up and I think we have just scratched the surface on how to really build an awesome resource for the thousand dollar challenge. How about you take this challenge with us? So over the course of the next month, I will be held accountable to you, Brad. I'll tell you guys, you know, what I, I'm, we're going to do a no spend month. I'm going to do a no spend month and just kind of use this as a kind of an anchoring point when you. I think so many of us get excited more about the getting than we are about the having. We haven't even taken the time to use the stuff we already purchased. We're already thinking about the next thing. So let's use some combination of this anchoring method, this intentionality over the next month, and let's get that $1,000 set aside. Now, here's what I want from you. You're listening to this. You're excited about the idea. You're like, oh yeah, that's what I needed. I'm going to do that. I want you to give us your feedback. I want you to give us your comments. I want to let us know what are you going to take this challenge with us? So just say challenge accepted, right? Leave it in the comments below the article or on Facebook. Two, if we miss something or you have a creative idea on how you would go about saving this $1,000 that we didn't mention, or you have something to illustrate how you could go farther with it, do that. And then three, the third half of this, and we can kind of come, you know, this can taper over the next month. What are you going to do with the $1,000? What does that $1,000 mean for you? What does it represent? And how are you going to use it going into the remainder of this year? So I guess my question is, do you accept this challenge? Now, Brad, I'm not going to put the challenge on you, although you and Laura can voluntarily join. I realize I send back to you with this, but I personally, I've talked to my wife about it. We are personally taking on the no spin challenge for the month of February. And uh, to our community, I hope that you will join us if this is something that you could use. If you decided to accept the challenge, go ahead and put in the comments below, challenge accepted. Let us know what you're doing and how. We'd love to stay with you on this journey. Like, comment, subscribe if you want more of this content.